member of the primary industries executive team, driving the development and implementation of strategies designed to build and enhance the department's scientific research, consistent with industry requirements. He's been heavily involved with establishing the research collaboration and works extensively with academia and various agencies across the country. Now I'm just going to begin briefly <clears throat> just to talk about emissions reduction and DPIRD's role. Now, as we're all aware, there's a growing demand for low carbon and carbon neutral products from both the supply and, and consumer, consumer perspective. perspective. Both industry and producers want to understand how they can achieve net zero, and we are, we are there with that on that journey with them, because DPIRD plays an important role from both a research, education and adoption perspective. We also know that our farmers can deliver. We've got uh, the coal certified carbon neutral beef and pork. We've got CBH, which last week announced their climate active certification of 10,000 tonnes of malt barley to produce 200 million bottles of beer, which is great news on a Friday afternoon. And they're using carbon credits from a project in the, the WA's Great Southern, which is a really great story to, to show us what we're capable of doing in this space of climate active. We also have Harvest Road, they're building their sustainable ecological farming um, business, but they're also minimising their footprint. So we've got many, many examples across Western Australian agriculture where our farmers, as I said, are delivering. A low carbon world brings opportunities and how we get there will vary. This is where Deep Herd plays a role. That we need a lot of research and development in this area, things like the manipulation of feed systems and understanding of the impact of forages, Genetics, I was speaking to Murray Gray uh, the other day talking about the genetics of his herds. Bioeconomic modelling, the life cycle analysis needs to be done. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on the carbon calculators to make them specific to each industry and also to Western Australia. And then of course there's waste treatment as well. So we have a range of um, different levers available to us as an industry and Deep Herd of course is very heavily involved both from a research perspective but working with industry. Now I'm going to hand over now to um, Mandy, who many, of, as I said, will, many of you will know, and Mandy will then do a recap of what's happening with the missions and talk about the work that they've been doing. Thank you, Mandy. Thanks, Kerry, and welcome all. It's great to see so many of you online. Um, and as Kerry said, I'm just going to give a bit of a recap and where we're at with the agricultural sector emissions reduction strategy and a few other uh, bits and pieces whilst I've had the opportunity of having some of you online. So, but to start with, for the agricultural sector emissions reduction strategy or SIRS, I'm going to call them SIRS from now on because that's such a mouthful. Um, just wanted to set out what some of our guiding principles are. There's guiding principles from the perspective of the overall state's SIRS, but DPIRD had some of their own guiding principles. Uh, and a, a key one of these is the reporting and planning uh, we're focusing on agricultural industries emissions, not just the agricultural sector emissions as calculated by the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And I'll talk a little bit more about the differences uh, in that. The other one is though, all my, although methane from livestock is a major source of emissions in, West, in Western Australian agriculture, we and if we just wanted to have impact on the big source, we would just focus on methane. But what we're doing is focusing on all industries or all major industries uh, in West Australian agriculture. So uh, whether, whatever their size, so extensive livestock, intensive livestock, grains and horticulture, um, because we felt that was really important that, that all those industries contribute a lot to Western Australian agriculture and Western Australian food security, all sorts of things. So we wanted to ensure that everybody was being included. Um, the, Adoption, we're going to have an adoption focus on this. As you all know, it's about um, how people actually implement what changes they need to, to achieve carbon neutrality or just reduce them, their emissions. Um, but there are some focuses that are different between industries and some that go across all industries. We're also including land use, land use change, forestry in a lot of our discussions because um, agricultural land managers have a major impact on this sector. So that's just sort of some overlying, overlying bits. 
bit of a quick recap. So on the left hand of your screen, there's the National Inventory Accounting 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 um for <laughs> for the agriculture sector sorry that that's uh moved across but on the left there you can see that's the breakdown of agriculture's emissions in 2020 which is the baseline year for the agricultural CERS. um it's approximately 10 percent of the state's emissions the way it's calculated as a sector agriculture's pretty special we get our own sector tourism doesn't get its own sector mining doesn't get its own sector um, you know, um, restaurants don't get their own sector but agriculture gets its own sector and that brings with it some really important things but also some complexity so just uh, on the left there you'll see those six contributing uh, areas to our emissions the one that's not represented there is rice cultivation which is included in the IPCC um, set of things that are covered, but because rice isn't a big thing in Western Australia, that sort of disappears off. So as you'd all be aware, that big blue part of the pie is enteric fermentation. The next one is agricultural soils, uh, liming urea application, manure management, and then field burning of residues. On the right is what agriculture industries have for their uh, accounting. And as as um, Kerry pointed out, we are we are about what our industry emissions are, what our products emissions are, because we've, agriculture operates in a, a marketplace, and it, and we export our our produce, which people are expecting to have lower emissions. Um, so we um, and to do that, we actually have to include all those agricultural sector emissions. We have some pre-farm inputs that we have to to um, make sure that we have uh, in our agriculture industry emissions. We include things like energy, which is you know stationary engines, harvesters, tractors, cool rooms on farm if you're a horticulturalist, or um, dairies, um, hot water, all sorts of things. And then there's um, sorry, and and sorry, there's there's energy, uh, the electricity component of that. And down the bottom there in green, we have land use, land use change in forestry. And I'm putting it in green because it is actually a sink for um, what happens on agricultural land. This is the national inventory data, but we've decided we've divided it up by industry or product, if you like, just to show you that impact of methane, which is mainly, it's that extensive livestock, um, most of that is methane contribution. So you can see that the livestock sector is a major part of this. Um, cropping is that green, and you can see it's an increasing emission source, um, but it's still less than livestock. Horticulture and intensive and other, other livestock are quite small parts still really important really important the other one is the three gases that are important to agricultural reporting and methane you can see there is a big chunk of our reporting nitrous oxide and co2 are still important but methane is a dominant one and don't forget that although beef, sheep and dairy are key contributors to this methane, they are key contributors to our export earnings, regional economy and jobs, and our food. Um, livestock play an important role in the agricultural system, but also particularly in the pastoral systems. Um, methane is a highly warming greenhouse gas, whichever way you want to calculate it. And so reduction now or in the short, it will have an impact on global warming. And don't forget, we have actually signed up as a country to the Global Methane Pledge. Uh, this slide, I just wanted to show you that there's different impacts. So we're looking now at industry emissions, not just sector emissions. The green, the light green is the agriculture sector emissions. That's what's calculated in the national inventory. But so for beef, sheep and dairy, big proportion of that is captured in the agriculture sector emissions. However, for, for industries like eggs, chicken meat, grains and horticulture, some of those other emissions, non-sector emissions, but really important if we're going to report our emissions as a product, 
come from other other parts and that's why we felt it was particularly important for the ag sur agricultural SIRS that we did it by industry and did it by industry emissions because they're quite different profiles. So therefore, one size isn't going to fit all. Uh, and land use, land use change forestry, and I've called it a variable carbon sink beast to put it. Um, that's a bit of a noun cluster that Prof Lindsay would be not very happy with, but it, it is a beast. Um, and just very quickly for some of you online who may not be across this sector, it's a really, it's a really important one uh, for the state. This is where our sequestration happens. The map on the left, and you can see the land use categories. Every year, the National Inventory Team use spatial data to determine what land use in that year is occurring on which <laughs> parcels of land. So we think of forest land, we tend to think of forest land as, you know, the southwest forests, but you'll notice how big the forest land category is in incorporating the western woodlands, mulga, mulga shrublands. It's quite a big category. Grassland, there's a little bit on the, on the southwest coastal plain and a bit around Denmark, Manjama, but the huge amount of grassland is what happens out in the arid interior and across our rangelands. So that's a massive category. Um, Cropland is pretty defined as we as we know, because the agricultural zone, uh, if you like, that's in rotation with pastures. So whatever's called cropland is in rotation with pastures and crops. You can see that there. So that that forms the basis for the estimations of the carbon sinks. So uh, Full cam is run across those pixels with that attributed land use, and they come up with what is estimated to be the sequestration or emissions from those land uses. And when I say that it's a variable carbon sink base, you can see there I've put the 2020 figures and the 2021 figures. So for Lulu CF in 2020, it was minus 9 million tonnes. Uh, in uh, 10 million tonnes. In 2021, it was minus 14 million tonnes. So that's a year apart. This is this is what we're having to deal with. We've got this variable thing. It's driven by, by climate, by seasons, uh, by fire, by harvesting, by changing, changing categories because there's been clearing or planting or whatever. But you can see there that um, forest land category is our big Big contributor and land converted to forest. So that might be grassland converted to forest. It might be um, um, ag uh, cropland converted to forest. The cropland category, and sorry, and forest land is mainly above ground carbon. That's what drives that whole thing. Cropland and grassland is mainly driven by below ground carbon. And for any agricultural manager, this is where the good stuff that farmers do gets captured. So it doesn't get captured as a minus against our agricultural emissions. If you convert to minimum till or to no till, or you increase your soil carbon on farm, it's captured in this category, not in agriculture. And you can see we're a bit of a, a net emitter in some, of, in some of those categories. Done a little bit of a... Um, a cut and dice here, and this is just an estimation. We have been working with DQ to get better data on this so we can actually make some true uh, allocations of what Lulu CF happens by land tenure and by um, and by land use, as in is it um, grazing in the southwest or is it grazing um, in pastoral stations or is it just uh, unallocated crown land with grassland that's doing all the work. We we haven't got that detail, so, but I've had a bit of a play here, so bear with me. Um, so total agricultural sector emissions, we've got those um, across the top. Sorry, there's a cursor just sitting on the top there, but that is fine. Um, the, you'll see those there. So going into the Lulu CF, what I've done in this next column is I've made a, a, a partition of those Lulu CF numbers by the proportion of land we think it might be happening on. 
So forest remaining forest, and remember that was a big one. I've said, well, normally that might be 1% on agricultural land. It might be people people ensuring that their that their uh, bushlands or whatever on on their properties is is um, being looked after, um, and so retaining its status as a sink. The land converted to forest, I've taken a liberty here and put 95%. Now, it may be less than that because there is a lot of reforestation happening on mining leases, for example, in the gold fields. Um, and some of the lands that were classed as grasslands may be growing into tree cover, which then makes them convert to forest. But bear with me on that one. 100% of the cropping land remaining cropping land. Take it on the chin. That's what we've got. Land converted to cropland. Um, land converted to grassland. The 38% relates to the fact that the rangelands covers about 38%. Uh, sorry, the pastoral leases cover about 38% of the rangelands. So, so you can go. Okay, well, under those sorts of um, assumptions, um, we're in 2021. The sequestration rate. Um, is about minus 10 um, million tonnes. A lot of that's driven by that land converted to forest, and then we may have that wrong, but going with that. And you go, well, agricultural sector emissions, and it's just sector emissions, are about 10 million tonnes as well. So there's a bit of a balance there, But and I don't want you to be so much hung up on the numbers, but we need to remember that the agriculture sector is a driver of good land use, land use change sink and responsible for it. But we hope to have a more accurate table provided for you in a couple of months. Um, been working with DQ on that. Now, the other thing I just wanted to recap, because we haven't had a chance really to talk to a lot of people um, since we've done a bit of the consultation and it'll be a little while before the agricultural um, SIRS report is released by the state government. Um, there was subject matter expert consultation, the options paper and the public consultation, and we've done some modelling uh, growth predictions where we talk with industry about what some of those would be. Um, the 10 big things, some of you online will have been at the 10 big things. This was a bit of a joint one between the research collaboration and the SERS program. Uh, July 22, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say it was about a year ago, but there you go. Um, the outcomes from the workshop it was a really, really good session, and a lot of you contributed um, substantial knowledge and experience in what the gaps were, what some of the overlapping um, issues were, what was being done already. And really, it did confirm the need for coordinated policy and planning for land use um, in particular. And we know about the increasing pressures on agricultural land from growing industries such as carbon offsets and renewables. There was that talk about the adaptation and mitigation, and we're under the, under the process of the climate adaptation uh, work that's happening, as well as mitigation. They're both really, really important. Um, we had some quite strong discussions on methane reduction and looking at GWP star. And some of you will have come along to the lecture that Frank Mittliner gave in November last year. And if you missed it, it's on our uh, Climate Resilience website if you want to listen to that quite an interesting presentation. We also had a, a, a non-supportive view uh, from Mark Howden, who's um, the vice chair of the IPCC. Uh, as well, his his talk is on uh, is there as well. So that ten big things really allowed us to pull together some options to be considered for our public consultation and to do further work on what their what their impacts might be. So we recently went into a broader public consultation. We developed the options paper, uh, which is available on our website too. So with those sort of three overarching ESP sort of goals, if you like, economic impacts, environmental impacts, and social impacts. Uh, just to share with you some of the results from that industry survey. And up front, we asked this question about how can governments and industry best coordinate and complement investments? 
Um, and there you can see um, government that some thought it was a government role with stakeholder engagement, but most felt it was collaboration and information sharing across industry and governments. There was support for funding, grants and programs, um, and then you'll see there was some people who didn't think it was a priority issue. And I've included there some comments from that uh, from that survey. And it was quite interesting because a lot of it really supported the subject matter experts, which to me shows that there's subject matter experts and industry are pretty well aligned with what they're thinking. Um, and these these results coming from here and some of these comments, this is what we built um, built our our proposals that are going to go through to government and treasury shortly. We put out our best bet list with a few you know, odd ones in there um, and asked participants of the survey to rank what they thought was most important. And some of them are a little bit more specific. So for example, in number um, seven, the best practice manure management dairies and feedlots, you go, oh, that's right down the bottom. But don't forget, there weren't that many people who were focused on dairies and feedlots who were they were disproportionately not represented, if you like. But um, going through again, it came out about building skills and knowledge um, across the board, service providers and livestock producers, um, getting access to good tools, getting um, the methane contributions of livestock on different forages and grazing systems, getting better data. We we know it's probably not right. We don't know how wrong it is or how right it is. We want to get better data. Uh, and you can read those as we go down. For the grains industry, these were the options that we had and ranked um, most to least important. And again, you can see some of the, um, the repetitive themes and a lot of people who answered the grains industry section didn't answer the livestock. So it was truly across there. And then a lot of it is around fertiliser demand, nitrogen baselines um, and reducing synthetic, synthetic fertiliser applications, which, as we know, really makes sense when you when you see where the emissions are coming from. Intensive livestock and horticulture, and my apologies to the intensive livestock and horticulture sections, we blended you together in this survey. Um, and um, it, it wasn't that we, we were trying to diminish your response, but it was about keeping keeping the survey at the at the length that we wanted as many people to participate as possible. So these go across both those. Um, there was nitrogen fertilizers um, that came through from um, from horticulture. And don't forget to a lot of intensive livestock people also run broadacre uh, livestock and grains as well. Skills and knowledge came through again. Uh, irrigation, plant nutrition was important. Energy needs and energy needs um, are uh, energy is a is a, a substantial emitter um, in livestock and horticulture uh, industries. So and you can see through to those. So if we go to we also put in, although it's not part of our SIRS, our agricultural SIRS, we also put in about carbon sequestration potential because it is part of the farm the farm system, um, and yet again, it was about skills, knowledge, farm, farmer-friendly programs, but also getting better data, better data again. We need better data. We also had a session which industry groups and uh, came together to uh, work with Steve Wiedemann from Integrity Agriculture, who was running our uh, modelling prediction work. Um, he was really keen to understand what the industry growth projections were, um, whilst because that was an important part of the modelling um, going through. So there was, uh, we did a business as usual. If there is all, any ever a business as usual in ag agriculture, agriculture grows and changes and has things all the time, and there's lots of other players that can influence what happens. 
uh, but we did it for ag sector for the for the national inventory methodology but also from an industry uh, approach and as i said before we went did it by by product or by industry um and we tried to look at things like the on-farm fuel, electricity, imported feed, those sorts of things. The technical mitigation is one thing, but actually what we need to look at is how does it get adopted, what on the, what time scale, by whom, and what proportion of the land or the flock or the herd can it be um, implemented on. So there's there's a few things behind that that modelling. So it's quite a complex task, that modelling. Um, and a lot of modelling that people have seen in the past on the news has been based on industry targets. Oh, the red meat industry said they're going to be carbon neutral by 2030. Okay, therefore, uh, the, by 2030, there's going to be zero emissions from agriculture. We didn't base it on industry targets. We based it on that likely mitigation, which is a, a different approach to some of the other larger scale modelling that you might see. Um, the modelling for sheep and beef showed that the key mitigation technologies was likely to be delayed towards the end of the decade, and that's mainly if it's reliant on feed supplements, we've, we haven't reached a point where we've got feed supplement availability, and we're expecting that's going to take a little while. Feed delivery technologies for the grazing herd and flock. Um, and then there's a current high cost, um, and there's not a market um, driver at this stage. We're starting to see that. Um, and some of the strategies that were identified that we've been working on in the modelling was it's around that feed delivery mechanisms and MLA have been doing a lot of investment around that feed delivery mechanisms or investing in that. Um, early stage uptake of supplements when they're available. Uh, the work with the sterile leukina was identified as a key one for the north. Um, leukina has an endomethanogenic and a productivity um, contribution. Um, we there are good options with southern pastures, but it's about trying to make that all work together. So I go on to um, the pork industry, uh, for example, and some of the the, the modelling projected. We've got some issues in there. Uh, there's um, uh, manure management is a key, and although we've got a pretty pretty good robust industry around that there's there's significant costs in new infrastructure with covered ponds anaerobic digesters um we're also seeing this shift and this is in chickens and eggs not chicken or eggs <laughs> um is as we shift to outdoor production it's harder to manage the manure and we also don't know much about what actually the cycling of that manure and its impact is on our soils and the areas where these outdoor systems are being um, being put in place. So it's around that as much as anything and um, low cost covered ponds. There might be some other opportunities that was raised by industry about different treatments of effluents in ponds rather than having to go to anaerobic uh, for smaller uh, for smaller uh, players, um, some issues with the with the in, um, pork industry, but also uh, chicken and, and a bit of the egg, in that some of the diets of animals are using um, imported um, diets, which have higher emissions attached to them. I'm trying to see whether we can we can change some of that. The um, chickens, it's a bit similar here. Energy efficiency was a really big one behind the grid and electrification of the grid uh, were drivers and improving, improving diet. Same thing with the free range production. Um, it's about working with those with those known drivers to see what what we can do um, to help um, the chicken industry as a broader SERS and as an agricultural SERS. 
Um, grains, grains is an interesting one. High proportion of emissions in cropping arise from external emissions, the inputs. Um, and I've got there that grains were projected by industry to grow at three and a half percent per annum. So we've got some research gaps there, which a number of the researchers online have been working on for quite some time. Uh, and we need to keep building our knowledge uh, in that. And really the things that are under control of grain goers is around nitrogen use efficiency, right time, right product, right place, um, right application, those, those sorts of things. Uh, horticulture. Uh, horticulture had quite a few external emissions, a lot of it around electricity and fuel use, but then also um, fertiliser use uh, efficiency. Uh, so there was there were those two parts that are really important for horticulture, and a lot of it was different. Horticultural crops have quite different um, quite different profiles, carbon profiles, and really understanding that and being able to have some some good solid numbers that the industry can actually go out with and talk about how well we're doing. The industry growth projections. Um, and this was really about um, agriculture in Western Australia has been growing, growing in both production and in value. And we're not expecting that to suddenly stop or to reduce. So we needed to pull on that um, to base the modelling on, if you like. So um, if that's going to grow, and I do put their grow except for sheep, and that was that's not necessarily just about um, about live exports, as some people might be thinking. It's about water. It's about um, the actual. Um, oops. I need to do. Is it dropped everywhere? No. It's just this one. Just this one? Yeah. It's like that other room that just drops out after an hour. I don't know if you've been going. You reckon? That's fine. Okay. Cool. Yep. You're back. Nice. Oh. That was just the intermission. That, yes, that was the intermission. That's when you got your <laughs> your chop bombs. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> not quite sure what happened there, but we we uh, we disappeared. So where was I? Uh, industry growth projections. So, and we know the demand and price of WA produce is increasing. We have good reputation, and there's a growing and insatiable demand for protein across the world, particularly in our export nation, our export. Um, partners. The other thing that uh, it took me a little while to get onto as well, WA population is ex expected to grow at 1.6% per annum. And so by 2035, that's equivalent to about 27%. So to give you a bit of a, a, a sort of a focus for that expansion that we've got on that table there. Um, so our goal is, has to be how to decrease emissions without constraining productivity and growth. So we need some really good technologies, efficient production um, to to be able to achieve to be able to achieve that. Um, oh, that's what I was saying with sheep. The decline was around water, competition for land and and cropping. If cropping is going to continue, and also with sheep too, we're we're getting more efficient. We're producing more with less animals, and so that does have a positive, well, positive, a good impact on our sheep emissions too. So, if if the industries are counted by the number of sheep, we're producing more with the same or less numbers of sheep. Um, that's not progressing because I'm on this machine. This machine's not got my. I can't progress on here because for oh. some reason. I can't. There we go. Ah, 
Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, next steps. Uh, so we've assessed the high priority options identified by both the public consultation, by the subject matter experts, by by conversations across the nation with subject matter experts and in different industry groups as well. Um, and pull that together to start uh, informing our proposals that we'll put forward as part of the SERS. And we've been as tight and as focused on the priorities as possible. We can't do everything, um, but we need to be able to really focus on some of those key ones. But we have kept to that. We've got things for extensive livestock, intensive livestock, grains, horticulture, and the overall adoption program. So we are focusing on that. And uh, the Lulu CF has been included as well. And although it's a small part of the of the state's agricultural industry emissions, there were some consistent things across all industries, electricity, efficiency, and reducing diesel use. So they'll be included. So for example, for the for grains, it might be only 10%. But if the, but we need to still keep pushing that reduction uh, of use of fossil fuels for horticulture. There's some um, more opportunities around irrigation pumping as well as small machinery. Uh, so that's that's been a, a key focus. Um, I've got just a couple of minutes, um, and I thought I'd just share with you a little bit more about the carbon neutral livestock at the Quintenning Research Station. Uh, so uh, we announced that our target of achieving carbon neutral uh, status for Katanning Research Station uh, in 2020. And there were a couple of reasons we did this. One was it's the right thing to do. <laughs> uh, the next one was that um, we wanted to have somewhere where we could demonstrate emerging and and proven technologies in a farm system, particularly for broadacre farm system. A place, Katanning was going to be a place where we we're going to do a whole lot of research as well. So how do we bring it together? Um, and to be able to go out and talk to industry with any level of experience and practical implications, we wanted to be able to have tried it ourselves to find out where the glitches are, where the gaps are. We were just going, oh, geez, we're not sure about that. Or, hey, this has been a really big change for us at Katanning. And so the, we did get some extra funding beginning of last year. Some of you will be aware of that. Um, and it's going to be not all at Katanning, but very much focused on Katanning. So the three areas, one was demonstrating those ready to adopt practices and technologies. And there's just a couple of examples of some of the things we're doing at Katanning uh, uh, around that. Um, the second one was research groundbreaking opportunities for broadacre farms. Um, and um, these were as much around methane, um, but, but the pasture systems and feed additives. And one of the things that we really identified that we we're just not confident on the numbers that we're given to calculate what um, our annual emissions from a sheep flock are. And we really want to do that on the pasture and, and um, feed systems that our animals run. So we've got some key some key numbers that we are confident with and we can and we can be confident when we talk to industry that these are for us. And the third one was um, trying to put, pull it all together. There's so many parts of agriculture, agricultural industries that you guys are always juggling everything from day to day nuances. Is today the right day to spray? Is it the the broader broader decisions around fertilizer application? You know, um, crops to plant, how breeding policies for animals, uh, lime, do I do some soil amelioration, do, whatever it is, it's about trying to pull it together. But at the same time, talking about the vegetation opportunities on farm. 
So, for example, at Katanning, we've got considerable saline areas that are degraded and not producing anything. So we want to be able to rehabilitate that, regenerate it, and provide um, provide more feed because that actually reduces our our inputs. Um, and I do want to show off just a little bit and. I know UWA, you're on the line. You got one too, I know. But uh, <laughs> this is our new cattle unit that's uh, recently been commissioned, um, set up, ready to go, hopefully uh, uh, looking at put on a dairy herd to start with and then beef herds, trying to get an idea of really that genetic variation, animal variation and on different pasture systems. and. They're actually somewhere around Perth Airport are four sheep units that we'll be setting up to be running at Katanning and or other places to get real time data on what our animals are doing on the feed and forage systems that we have. And these ones, Beth, I know you're online and I grabbed these from a presentation of Beth. Beth said, this is what we want to be able to provide for you. Uh, and this is based on the work at Katanning. We want to be able to go, OK, what can we reduce that blue line down to that green line by feed additives in this part of the year? Then what grazing strategies pull it together so we can give you a lower profile data for what your flock might be doing? And breeding for improved genetics so overlaid on that green and blue line. We've got some uh, genetic gains that we think we have. And Beth did announce the other day, I think you said 2025, Beth, that we'd have our first breeding value. So, um, but those are the sorts of things that we want to be able to bring together um, uh, for, for everybody. Katanning, what's the plan? There's my Iced Vovo version of the Katanning plan. Um, and quite a lot of work's been happening in there. To give you just a quick, like, these are sorts of the bits and pieces that we've been working on. We've got a great team there. We're going to be bringing in the next phase of happening across the property. It's not an easy property to to work with, given its nature of uh, it's very um, separate, but it also goes from very good country down into saline area down near the airport there. Um, done some detailed soil carbon testing, set up monitoring sites that we're going to be able to, to map what we're doing through there. Um, and it's a little bit of a snapshot there about how we're, how we're doing. So we've been focusing on rehabilitation of salt land and our, and our vegetation. That's been our key focus to start with. Got a bit delayed with COVID and then a very wet uh, uh, wet spring last year where we st we struggled to get everything in. We started looking at reshaping the sheep flock uh, and we've achieved a reduction of 10% there and it's given us some carbon reduction. Electricity, there was only 1% of our emissions on the station, even though we run, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff, but it's one of those low hanging fruit. And I'm going to leave it there, I think. I won't go into inserting. Have I got in, have I got enough time? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, put up this one because it's just something that we always could like to keep making sure that that um, what the process is for an for a business, for an enterprise. And this is my um, where I see the four key steps. The first one is for producers to do a quick and dirty. Use the online tools, get your basic carbon account, figure out whether your numbers are five or fifty thousand. You know, get get some get some numbers. And then you can also determine what sort of sequestration opportunities there are. Do some what if analyses on changing things on farm. Do some looking at what sequestration you're likely to be able to get. Business planning is always important. Different things suit different businesses. So what's the strategy? What's your long-term goals? Where does it fit? And then we've got, um, if you're wanting to go further, i.e. achieve carbon neutrality for your product, for example, are you going to be looking at insetting carbon? Um, or, you're going, whoops, or you're going to be looking at um, offsets 
to be able to sell. So those are sort of the, the four steps in my mind. And I wanted to just flag this new insetting method that's going to be registered with Climate Active. We're hoping it's pretty, going to be pretty soon. Um, and this one is different to an ACU. They're not tradable. It's a supply chain um, uh, verification. Uh, and it's really an annual carbon balance. So you put forward what your annual carbon balance is. What did you emit in that year minus what you grew in carbon? So it's a balance sheet. It's a running a running balance sheet. Um, there's going to be uh, seven methods. The first one is the one that's about to be released, which is accounting for carbon sequestration from tree planting. We're also going to run a pilot at Catanning so we understand how the measurements are going to work, what some of the issues might be. It's a very new method. The nice thing or what the, the exciting thing about this is it's a little bit different from the ACU process where you have to register a project. You've got to do your planning, register it, then you can start, then you can start the um, implementing it. This, because it's a it's an annual account, a balance sheet, if you like, um, you don't need to do that. You still need to register that you, your your carbon balance, for example. So it has much lower costs, um, and also what it allows is that producers can hold on to those and use it in the supply chain that they're selling products into. As I said before, it's going to be uh, run by Climate Active. Uh, and if you do have plantation or some revegetation, there's a lot of producers out there in Western Australia who did some magnificent work across the 80s and 90s and 2000s. So, for example, you planted um, a, um, a a block of trees on your farm in 2000 in 2005, and it's still growing. It's still sequestering, actively sequestering you can actually put that on your balance sheet, even though it was done back then. So it's how much grew. Of course, if you bulldoze it, you'll need to take it off your balance sheet. So up from, from um, 1990, anything that's grown. The other thing is if you've got shelter belts or narrow belts, which don't, uh, which aren't really captured by the, the ACU uh, program, they can be included on here. So the cost level, is also much lower. So that's an exciting thing. It has to go through a process uh, with Climate Active, so it's verified, and we'll keep you up to date with anything we find out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mandy. We'll now move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Kelly Pierce. For those people that joined a little bit later, Kelly's our new director for the WA Agriculture um, Research Collaboration and I will now hand over to her. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, Cameron, you're on slide duty. We've just had a few um, slide issues today. Um, so look, uh, I'm just going to very quickly run through what is the collaboration. I think there's a few people online that might not be familiar with it. So first slide, Cameron, please. Okay, so the collaboration is basically a, a partnership before, between the four uh, West Australian universities, CSRO, GGA and DPERT. An MOU has been signed and this, this MOU outlines basically the principles to sort of guide the partnership and the behaviours that are expected, particularly around when approaching um, new funding opportunities. Next slide. So the core of the collaboration is really around mature research partnerships, uh, you know, less of this silo sort of fragmented approach to R&D that we've seen over the years. And the, the focus is on building strong collaborative consortia, longer term projects that put really put WA back on the R&D map. Uh, the other important thing to, to note about this collaboration is that it has a strong focus on capacity building. So rebuilding a decimated R&D um, capacity within our state and all projects um, that the collaboration will be involved with must demonstrate this, this it's, it's happening. Next slide, Cam. So the, the, the collaboration has a lot of goals. 
um, it's an amazing opportunity actually to bring together um, a multidisciplinary team from the collaborators, so maybe outside of your traditional ag schools at uni, um, to, to pull together some you know real transformational cutting edge work. We've got a lot of incredible talent um, and skills within our particular universities in Syro and Deepurg um, that we could definitely pull together better. And next slide, Cam. So underpinning the collaboration is a $25 million investment from Treasury over the next three years. And the hope is that we'll do this collaboration well and grow that pot over the next 10 years. The key point to mention here is that the $25 million and the $10, from GRD, the 10 million from GRDC uh, is dollars that must be used to leverage or co-fund or match with other external projects or funding. So it's very unlikely that the collaboration will ever fund projects in isolation. So next slide. So there are six programs within the collaboration. The three core projects, Northern Australia, Grains Transformation and Climate Resilience. And then there's three cross-cutting programs which will essentially be embedded or integrated within those three core projects. Each of those um, core programs already has project leads and has quite experienced technical advisory committees in place. So um, it's on a roll already. Uh, next slide, Kim. So the Northern Australia program, program one, is contracted and, and working through quite well at the moment, uh, being led by Clinton Ravel and Dean Thomas. Uh, it's really around the intensification of the northern beef industry and also you know, work within um, irrigated agriculture. There is a feedlot currently being uh, designed and built on the research station in Kununurra um, and certainly opportunity here for measurement of emissions from that intensification. So next slide. Apologies about this slide situation too. <laughs> so I've got grains transformation. Um, being led by Kerry Regan, really does have some quite big um, goals in terms of trying to reduce the input use across our grains industry. Uh, there is a strong focus in this project, particularly on reducing the use of synthetic nitrogen. Um, we will have a number of projects in particular that will focus on growing nitrogen. Um, certainly, we've seen that has an impact on tier two emissions. And projects will certainly have um, the incorporation of measurement and, and quantification of emissions um, under these new systems incorporated into their projects. So next slide is climate resilience led by Kim Brooksbang. Um, really, this, this scope of work is, is around um, doing what we can to reduce carbon emissions and helping to prepare farms for, for future climate extremes. Uh, I'll come back to this in a bit more detail in a second, but Cameron, if you can just change the slide. We do have these three cross-cutting projects, as I've mentioned as well, um, you know, doubling Aboriginal uh, employment in agriculture, uh, using ag tech to improve um, margins, as well as capacity building and extension. That's a very important component that will be included in every program. So next slide. So the, the climate program is still very much in development and it has mapped out two sub-programs. And, and we've certainly heard here today that there's a number of deep herd and other partner initiatives in this area. So this program can certainly value add those programs as well as identify areas that require future work and, and fund in that area. So the two sub-programs that have been identified so far is the Future Ready um, Farm Program, which seeks to investigate transformational change to prepare farms for, for future climate pressures and future markets. The Resilient Farming Systems Project uh, will seek to work on projects with you know, novel and adapted crops and forages and pastures for lower rainfall to fill feed gaps. They will look at desal, desalination options, diversified farm income opportunities, carbon farming, solar energy. The Robust Landscape sub-program will explore building farm systems to cope with extreme climate scenarios, so perhaps work on landscape design to reduce erosion, increase production systems or maintain production. The sub-program two, uh, Future Facing Farms, will have a strong um, focus on reducing emissions and finding ways to, to decarbonise food production. Um, I mean, certainly the, the optimising offsets program here 
or really uh, sort of hope to you know have a lot of potential work on maximising sequestration and co-benefit opportunities. You know, the potential to look at land management planning and research into tree and, and perennial species to maximise biomass carbon. Also looking at more cost effective measurement technologies. And the carbon industries sub theme there um, will look into new industries that can emerge as a response to the need to balance carbon emissions. So potential areas of work uh, could include you know, carbon neutral products, biofuel feedstocks, low carbon alternative fertilizers such as green ammonia and even do work on engineering solutions to reduce um, farm emissions. So next slide, please Ken. So uh, we're at the stage where there was a call for expressions of interest and this week the successful applicants were notified and they'll go through to full application stage due in September. Um, next slide, Ken. So just important to note that this first call, this first EOI process uh, does have a focus on wheat belt projects, but future calls will have more of a Northern Australia, perhaps horticulture and other industry focus. Um, the proponents that have gone through the full application stage uh, will need to identify co-investors and co-funders for their work, and many have got verbal and letters of support. Um, and so quite hopeful that these will, will get funded, but there are a lot of projects happening in our state, so it's making sure that this, this program integrates with what's also happening across the state. And, and um, there were other excellent projects that were submitted to this EOI um, that we'd like to, to, to develop as well. So if you want to get involved, um, there is, next slide, Cam, sorry. There are a list of, um, you know, this is the technical advisory committee for this program. Um, so if you want to get involved or have any ideas, future EOI programs, you know, these are the, the technical leads for each of the collaboration uh, organisations. So get involved or get in touch with, with us, me. So thanks for that. Very quick snapshot. Thank you very much, Kelly. And it's really nice to put, be able to put a face to a name and uh, look forward to seeing the wonderful things that the uh, research collaboration brings forth in the next few years. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ben Bidolf, who's our Chief Scientist here in the Prime Minister's Development. And I will now hand over to him. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry, and thanks a lot, Kelly, for giving that presentation. It's great to have someone else on uh, to share the load with the research collaboration um, and look forward to, to working with you um, and the rest of the partners of the collaboration going forward. Um, so today here, I'm just here to give you guys and industry a quick snapshot of the zero net emissions for agriculture uh, for, zero, for zero net emissions, CRC, with the University of Queensland. Um, the CRC um, is a great opportunity for West Australian research teams uh, to get together to work in this national space. Um, this, and CRCs give us one of those opportunities to do it. Um, why are CRC for zero net emissions? Um, I probably don't really need to convince this audience um, around that, um, but the real advantage of CRCs is they are multi-stakeholder approaches to working on an industry solution um, and industry challenges. They work across industries, so they're not focused on one particular industry as well. Um, and it's one opportunity that we get to leverage Commonwealth funding um, with our actual R&D funding at the state level uh, to try and work on larger programs and larger problems, um, and also over long time frames. Traditionally, CRCs run over over 10 year time frames. Um, why is DPIRD looking at being a partner and why is West Australia a strong partner for this? Um, this is really closely aligned with our Protect, Grow and Innovate um, stewardship that we have as the department and our research priorities in this area. Um, and obviously, you know, no, don't really need to reiterate how the alignment is with our, the other programs and speakers before me. Um, there's four main progr research programs with the Zero Net Emission CRC, um, and I'll go through those in a bit more detail now. Um, WA's involvement, sorry, before I get into that, WA's involvement, just like to acknowledge that there's also a lot of other people on the line today, particularly UWA, who's also a tier, tier one partner in this potential CRC bid, um, as well as some industry partners from Western Australia are already keen to be involved, including the Grower Group Alliance, Ag 023, uh, Yaru and Noongar Land Enterprises in our north, um, and KPCA is also missing off that list I've just realised, um, as well as some as CSB, Nutrient Elders, 
um, and some of the other industry partners in Western Australia. Uh, where is the CRC's bid? So for those of you who aren't involved in CRC's, it really takes about two years to get a CRC up. There's a stage one phase, which we submitted in March this year um, in collaboration with UQ, um, who are leading the bid um, and the other industry partners in Western Australia. We got through that stage one process and at the moment we are finalising the emission of stage two submission, which is due at the end of August. So we've got about another three weeks to finalise uh, to convince um, the Commonwealth, what what the you know what's the scope of this CRC um, and what's the value of this CRC? If we are successful um, through that stage two application process, we'll go through an interview process with the Commonwealth in October um, 2023, and that will lead to announcement um, in December next year and potential starting of the CRC essentially in the next financial year in June 24. Um, this is actually a really large CRC, so what's the value of it? So obviously I'm just presenting kind of a bit of a West Australian context to it, but essentially it's one of the largest CRC bids ever put up. Um, but, you know, I think there's good evidence and good reason why we need that. Um, agriculture needs to play a significant role um, in our transition towards net zero um, as an industry, but also as a major land use holder. Um, so we have, you know, there's good evidence of why we should actually have a large CRC in this space. Um, it's around 314 million 10 year enterprise value. That's kind of the kind of bid we've got. Um, there's six state and government um, equivalents also investing in this CRC. So we have strong commitment from New South Wales DPI, New South Wales, um, sorry, New South Wales DPI, SARDI in South Australia, um, as well as Agricultural Victoria. Um, there's around 140 million of partner in kind from um, essentially uh, industry partners, 90 million from partner cash. So that's the research partner cash. Um, 53 industry and end user partners around um, the extoption and indention phase, 10 universities nationally, um, and essentially we're requesting around at 90 million from the Commonwealth as part of this CRC bid. Oop. Um, what are the actual details? So this I'll get into a bit more details. There's four main research programs which we put together with the um, rest of the bid team. Um, and what, the first one's around low emission plant-based solutions. Um, for essentially looking at how we can develop and optimise our broad acre and horticultural production systems, as well as reduce um, the, the methane emissions from our food production system, uh, from our fodder production um, through antimethanogenic plant properties um, and higher productivity mis mixed species pastures. Um, research program two is really more around livestock focused towards methane free cattle and sheep um, to provide the technology and quantification required for that transition of livestock to a low methane um, future. Research program three is more of a whole farm um, and mixed enterprise system analysis um, and Marriott who's on the call here has been really helping pull together some of the research program three. Um, this program will integrate all of the science emerging from the CRC to provide farmers with the guidelines, sources, metrics and benchmarking tools um, for this profitable transition to zero net emissions. Um, and then research program four is really about delivering value from net zero. So how do we work this through um, the supply chain and how do we create those circular economy solutions for agribusiness and rural communities to improve that supply chain management and enhance access to our export, our key export markets, which Marriott's also been strongly involved with. A um, bit more detail around these low emission plants based solutions. So what kind of research are we looking at scoping in there? So some of that in the genetic solutions around how do we improve nutrient use efficiency of our existing crops um, and our existing production systems. Um, plant nutrient solutions, how do we design and develop more effective um, nutrient application methods and solutions, as well as how do we actually reduce our nitrous oxide losses in those legumes? How do we get better production um, and nitrogen fixation from our broadacre pasture legumes, as well as our, our crop legumes in our production system? Um, and the last program in that is around how do we make sure that the grow, the, the plants that we do produce um, for insetting, um, actually maximise the insetting in that land use area and how do we implement those into our mixed farming system to maintain a productive and profitable production system. Research program two, which is really around that livestock, um, there's four main components in there. I've just noticed another typo, but the first one is around novel individual animal methane measurements and proxies for that. So one of the biggest challenges we've got is actually getting good measurements in that space. So that's more of a how do we improve the measurement systems and technologies we've got for that to make sure we're actually being accounted for what our actual emissions are. Uh, the second one is around actually genetic selection for low emission livestock. So how can we actually improve the livestock and reduce the emissions in the livestock that we have? There's good evidence that there is genetic variance in that 
um, in most of our in our cattle and sheep industries. Um, the fourth, third one there really, which has slipped to four, um, is around room manipulation for lower emissions. So what can we do um, in terms of that rumen to actually reduce the emissions through that through the life of those animals? Um, and the fifth one is around that delivery of low emissions innovations from the lab to the landscape. So how do we put all these things and uses together um, and deliver it um, into a system that producers can adopt? Research program three really has those three key ones around enabling on-farm mitigation and benchmarking tools for the monitoring of greenhouse gas sources and sinks, the integration of those systems on the farm and landscape analysis, and the synergies and trade-offs with other emerging ESG priorities, particularly probably, well, more likely around um, biodiversity in that space. Research program four is really about delivering value from zero net emissions. So in this path to zero net emissions, how do we do deliver and develop and capture value through the supply chain for that? Um, some of that's around the barriers and drivers uh, and po around policy and how do we manage the consumer expectations, circular economy solutions, renewable energy solutions, um, as well as about how can we improve that supply chain traceability throughout the actual supply chain for that. Um, there is also a large program around education, training, adoption and producer demonstration site network. So that goes across all of the research programs. There's 25 sites around Australia which will be the foundation of the CRC. They will include a lot of research and producer demonstration sites where we're actually measuring the emissions across their whole production and supply chain. Um, and there's also another component of that is around how do we develop the research capability for zero net emission agriculture. We need to develop industry capability in this space, but we also need to develop that next generation um, of professionals and research scientists in this space. Um, you know, methane research, all of these carbon neutrality research that we are doing or, or needing to do, there's new research skill sets that we actually need to develop, similar to some of the work that Kelly was talking about in terms of building our capacity um, as a research community, as an industry, um, to work in this space. This is just a quick snapshot um, of the major industry partners and other research partners who are involved with the CRC bid at the moment. Um, and just to give you a good representation of, of what that representation is like nationally, um, as well as some of those West Australian um, partners who have already come on board. Thank you. I'll hand back to Kerry. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and it's really great to see um, the work that's being done um, between DPIRD, the collaboration industry and the research institutions to really maximise the research opportunities that are available for us so that we capture those opportunities and really bring about the best outcomes for industry in the short, medium and long term. Now, I'm sure that there's um, plenty of opportunities for you to find out a little bit more, not only about these programs, but to also understand what Deep Herd is doing in this decarbonisation and reducing emissions space. Uh, the Carbon for Farmers vouchers round two will be opening very soon, so keep an eye out for that if you're interested in um, understanding a bit more about carbon farming and the opportunities on your property. Um, on the 17th of August, the Katanning Research Station Showcase will be on a really exciting opportunity. Hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll see many of you there. On the 24th of August is the Low Rainfall Research Field Day at Meriden. And again, really great to see lots of um, people coming along to find out more. There'll be people in the Deep Herd Sheds, as always, at Minganew, the Midwest Expo at uh, the 9th and 10th of August, the Darren Machinery Field Days at 30th and 31st of August, and the Newtigate Machinery Field Days as well. So some of the teams um, from both Carbon Farming and the, um, low, the Climate Resilience Program and others will be there. We've got the Regenerative Agriculture Conference that's coming up in Margaret River that's held, uh, being hosted by the Shire of Augusta Margaret River with sponsorship from Deep Herd, uh, and also the Matthew Evans um, Regional Tour. He's the chef um, that uh, I think it's Fat Pig Farm down in Tasmania. It's coming to talk about the importance of soil, etc. Um, then in February next year, the Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program Round 2 will open, um, sorry, Round 3 will open, and we'll also be having some Carbon Farming Regional Workshops throughout the year. There's one in Del Volonu next Tuesday. Um, they'll be talking about insetting as well as carbon farming more broadly. Um, now, we haven't had very many questions. Most of them we've been able to deal with in the chat, which is um, was great news. However, if you would like to get in contact with the Climate Resilience team, we've got the um, QR code there for you, but it's also climate resilience at deepherd.wa.gov.au should you wish to, um, find, uh, to ask any questions afterwards. 
I thank you for your attendance today. Thanks very much to Mandy, to Kelly and to Ben for um, providing us with an update of all of those things. And we wish you an excellent afternoon. Uh, hopefully some of that uh, low carbon um, grain beer will be in your future soon. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.